a, not a joint venture, it's actually still a joint operation. A lot of the things in the oil and gas are not joint ventures. Although they formed it sitting in a separate legal entity, the reality of it is they are not joint ventures. Even though they are called joint ventures for, for whatever purpose, they are not really joint ventures. That's IFRS 11. What does IFRS 12 say? Well, IFRS 12 wants you to disclose everything, unfortunately. It is so burdensome. I don't know how we're going to apply this in practice. It says whenever you have an interest, tell us about it. Now, what's an interest? It could be contractual and non-contractual. It could be through equity or debt instruments. It is funding, liquidity, credit enhancement. So things that you have guarantees, or, I mean, if you have provided a guarantee for a certain company, tell us about it. If you have shares in a company, tell us about it. If you have preference shares in some other company and it's a substantial amount, tell us about it. However, normal customer supplier relationships, we don't want to know. But anything where you have what is called an interest, and they define what's this concept of interest, then you have to tell us. Now, this is so broad. I think even worse than that, if you have unconsolidated structured entities, you need to tell us about those. So things that you avoided consolidation of, but you are still exposed to returns, tell us more about them. All these standards are effective 1st of January 2013. Early adoption is permitted. Which company? Who's going to early adopt? What's the status of early adoption in Pakistan? None. I don't think anybody wants to early adopt this. But there is, I mean, if you do early adopt it, you could have a problem. If somebody is following IS-27 and you following IFRS-10, it may be in that intervening period that two people consolidate or nobody consolidates that entity. All right. The last standard, or second last one, IFRS 13 on fair value measurement. IFRS 13 doesn't change things too much. Let's start off with that. What they, was, what they were saying, or what they found out is that, you know what, standards use the word fair value throughout the standards, but there's no combined guidance on how to calculate fair value. So what they did, they created a standard, and they put all the guidance in one standard. That's effectively what it is. It doesn't tell you when to determine fair value. Now let's look at this last bullet. IFRS 13 provides guidance on how to measure fair value rather than when to measure fair value. That comes from IFRS. And it doesn't give you more fair value requirements. What it does tell you is fair value is an exit price. So it changes the definition. It provides a framework. So this year, it's not taking away the valuator's job actually guiding the valuator how to value things. All right. The scope of it, you know what? IFRS 10 uh, apply, I, sorry, IFRS 13 applies wherever fair value is required. Some things are out of measurement because leases and share-based payments are out. IS 19, 26, and 36 are out of the scope with regard to disclosure. What is fair value now? This is interesting. They've changed the definition more towards a U.S. gap definition. The price that would be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer a liability in an orderly, orderly transaction between market participants. It's a current exit price with a market participant focus orderly transaction at the measurement date. That's it. Definition has changed. Will this change things a lot? Only the measurement of liabilities at fair value. Everything else seems to stay the same. Right. For non-financial assets, this is interesting. Non-financial assets, this is investment property, property, plant and equipment, whatever you want to measure at fair value, how do you measure this at fair value? There's a concept called highest and best use. Now before you, you get confused with this flow chart, let me give you a simple example. You've got property that you want to fair value. This is property. This property is currently being used as a, you're earning rental from it, you're earning rental from a, a school. It meets the definition of investment property. It is there, right? You are fair valuing it. Now, how do you fair value it? Do you fair value it as a school? What the standard asked before,
but now clearly asks for is value that property on its highest and best use. Now, if it is possible to convert that school into commercial property, you would value it on the basis of it being commercial property, rather than as a school. So how do you value property based on future rentals? Because if a market participant could come in tomorrow, take that school and, and sublet it as offices, that's what he's going to do. He's going to maximize it. So your fair value concept is he's trying to maximize value. If it could be maximized as residential property, that's how you value it. Even though its current use is not, well, is not that. To only to be able to use highest and best use, is it physically possible to have the school as commercial property? Yes. Is it legally permissible? If it can't be done, obviously you don't value it as a, as a commercial property. Is it financially feasible? Can he do it? Can he, will it maximize value? Yes. If that's the case, you will value that school as if it was commercial property. Because that's the highest and best use. And that's what a market participant would value that property at. He will optimize use. He's not going to under-optimize it. Now, if your fair value is very high, that means, hey, listen, why are you renting it out as a school? Chase the school away. <laughs> Put some property there. You understand that? You are taking the shareholder's money. You're not maximizing his return if you are underutilizing the asset. Anyway, that's the reality. All right. There's also the concept of level 1, level 2, level 3 fair value. This is continued. Level 1, unadjusted quoted market price. Level 2, you're using inputs from market. Level 3, unobservable inputs. There is no level 4. I promise you there's no level 4. At the height of the crisis, a lot of our clients didn't want to use quoted market price. They wanted to use what we call, they didn't want to use fair value. They wanted to use what we call happy value. What's happy value? Value that makes them happy. There's no such a value. There's no level 4 valuation. You either use quoted market price, something based on market, or something that's unobservable but reasonable. All right. And that's IFRS 13. So not too much change. Nothing to lose sleep over. My last section. Last section. Um, sorry, I'm skimming through it, but I don't think I need to go into too much detail or bog you with detail is the revisions to IS-19. Okay, What's, what are the changes? IS-19 changes. Current IS-19 says, if you have a pension fund, you're going to have to record a defined benefit obligation, you minus the fair value of the plan assets, then you take plus or less the deferred actuarial gains or losses. Why? Because you wouldn't recognize all the actuarial gains and losses because IS-19 has something called the corridor. And this corridor is a nonsense. Why do you have a 10% corridor, not 11% or a 15%? It's a nonsense. It was just a rule to, to insulate the financial statements from high fluctuations during the pension fund crisis in the Far East. Less past service costs, take into account the effect of the, the ceiling and you get a defined benefit asset or liability. What does the new IS-19 say? No, 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 wait a minute. All actuarial gains and losses do not form part of this because what you are going to be doing with these actuarial gains and losses are taking them directly to equity. They're going to be parked in OCI. This is no more choice. The choice exists in IS 1992A. It exists. The choice to take your actuarial gains and losses to equity. They're saying, no, no, no wait a minute. Everything now has got to go there. The effect of the asset stealing, ceiling still remains, and that's how you calculate it. What this means is that b before service costs, interest income, and expected return on assets, and actuarial gains you had a choice to take to PL or OCI, now you take service costs to PL, you only take net interest to PL, not the expected return. The remeasurements all go through OCI. If you've understood this slide, you understand how the changes have worked in IS-19. So this is the big change. There is another change that I'm going to talk to you about. Is
this one here. The 